Today's talk is not really part of my research as such, so it doesn't really inform anything I've written so far, but it is a product of um, thinking about how Cavafy fits into theories of world literature. Uh, so how Cavafy, be, how Cavafy came to belong to what we define as world literature. And I will draw on a few instances and highlights of this process, but also try to approach it a bit more theoretically in engagement with major um, theories of cultural production and global uh, circulation. Uh, so allow me to share my screen. Uh, I, I was told that this can get a bit glitchy because I've used um, Prezi rather than PowerPoint, which means that when I'm changing through slides, uh, it will not be as smooth um, as uh, expected. But please bear with me when it comes to that. Um, so I will start uh, from 1994, when Cavafy's poem Ithaca was recited a Jackie Kennedy Onassis funeral by her partner, Maurice Templesman. The concluding part of Templesman, Temple, Templesman's memorial address, and now the journey is over, too short, alas, too short. It was filled with adventure and wisdom, laughter and love, gallantry and grace. So farewell, farewell. Linked Jackie's life to the poem's content, which elevates the importance of the journey over the arrival at a destination. By the time this happened, Cavafy had already, already been translated extensively in both European and non-European languages, with English editions appearing both in England and in the United States. Authors of great caliber had engaged systematically with his work. Journals and magazines centrally located in the cultural scene, and I'm thinking here of The Spectator, The New York Review of Books, The Criterion, The Nation, had published his poems as well as numerous, often diverging, critical pieces about them. Cavafy's readership had become expansive across the globe, a reputation that also relied in no small measure on the mystique emanating from descriptions, rumors, and conjectures about the poet's idiosyncratic personality. In other words, Cavafy occupied the position of legendary celebrity in the cultural sphere. This celebrity was augmented even further by the sensationalism attached to the morning turn spectacle, leading to an unprecedented demand for his work. The height of this demand was registered in a little known letter by the publishing press Versa Books in the New York magazine. There, the press capitalized on the publicity generated in Cavafy's name during Jackie's televised funeral to announce its long-standing interest in the poet's work and the distribution of free copies of Ithaca to anybody interested. And I quote from the letter in the New York Magazine, and that's the editor of Verso Books writing, as longtime CP enthusiasts, CP Cavafy enthusiasts, along with Ian Forster, Lawrence Darrell, W.H. Auden, and T.S. Eliot, we at Verso Books were all as surprised as our venerable competitors to find ourselves sold out of Cavafy, Cavafy's just hours after Maurice Templesman's read from the poet's work at the funeral of Jacqueline Onassis. As a kind of bookseller's homage to Cavafy, Templesman, Mrs. Onassis, Forster, Darrow, et al., we had typed copy, uh, we had typed copies of Ithaca displayed in our 8th eight, Avenue window, and we photocopied 50 more copies for free distribution to customers, browsers, and other Cavafy and Onassis enthusiasts. Surprisingly, again that week, we found ourselves going back to the copy shop, copy shop across the street for four more batches and will keep up the free distribution of Ithaca as long as there is demand. During his poetry writing days, Cavafy distributed most of his poems on single broadsheets containing one or a few poems at a time, mostly to friends. We feel a happy poetic justice in passing Ithaca on in the same way. Peter Sutter, Versa Books, Manhattan. The editor of Versa offers here a glimpse into the poet's unconventional publishing strategy, which he proposes to emulate by printing Ithaca and Lou sheets. During his lifetime, Cavafy rejected conventional publishing, publishing practices. He preferred instead a private distribution of his poems to a select group of readers in the form of broadsheets and small collections. He never published an edition of his work during his lifetime, 
other than two chapbook sized volumes of poetry that he printed privately in 94 and 1910. In this way, he developed a singular method of publication. It consisted of individual poems printed at a local Alexandrian print shop, which he collated by hand into makeshift collections, and he circulated amongst friends and acquaintances. Now on Verse's part, forging a connection between the press's practice and Kavafi's publishing strategy was not just an occasion to load the poet, but also an act of virtue signal signaling. Around 1950, when the first publication of Kavafi's poems in translations appeared in England, it was fashionable to write of Kavafi's disregard for fame. It was remarked that, quote, since the invention of printing, there scarcely has been a poet of importance who did less to spread the appreciation of his own work. Similarly, E.M. Forster wrote that Kavafi had no idea that he could be widely desired, even in the stumbling north. To be understood in Alexandria and tolerated in Athens was the extent of his ambition. And I'm gonna expand further what uh, E.M. Forster means here by tolerated in Athens. Now, this is not strictly true, and we have ample evidence that Kavafi was interested in his own publicity as well as his posterity. Yet the ideal of disinterestedness has long been perceived to be central to good artistry. The worthy artist, focused on his craft, ostensibly operates free from financial or commercial concerns. Thereby arises the mythology of the reclusive artist, dedicated to their art, and aren't concerned with market demands. Versus free distribution, as long as there is demand, so perhaps infinitely, partakes of this narrative of disinterested commitment to good art. And the happy poetic justice encompasses a subliminal message. It announces a step away from profit in keeping with the priorities of an avant-garde publishing house or at least the priorities an avant-garde publishing house ought to maintain, a world apart from mass-produced art and commerci commercialization. Now, a marketing strategy that, resists, uh, that consists of resisting notions of art as merchandise is further uh, enhanced with the enumeration, and I'll turn back to this slide, uh, by the enumeration of hyper-canonical authors of the English-speaking world, such as Forster, Auden, Darrell and Eliot, who also took a keen interest in Kavafi. By joining a continuum of well-respected and supposedly entirely disinterested Kavafi enthusiasts, Verso claims to tread the same path as these illustrious predecessors. Events such as this produced additional momentum for Kavafi's work and were key to the ways in which the poet came to inhabit the mythology circulated in his name. At the same time, Verso's gesture of free distribution, of free distribution of Kavafi's poems was also geared toward an increase through Kavafi of its own cultural capital, a notion of value that is not necessarily tantamount to economic rewards against that of its venerable competitors. So Verso, by expressing devotion to Kavafi's work, casts a veil over its own interests as a stakeholder in the publishing industry, and does so by embracing the materiality of the work while denying its status as merchandise. And I mention this incident because it exemplifies a process of give and take that is at work within the cultural sphere, and that throughout the 20th century led to Kavafi's place in world literature as we know it today. Behind every act of appreciation also lay an act of self-realization by auxiliary agents who propelled forward the poet's reputation while catering to their own ambitions. It is of course widely accepted that the Anglophone literary, uh, literary market was most pivotal in advancing Kavafi's name to international renown. But little attention has been paid so far to these methodical cultural practices which were at the heart of the poet's journey from the depths of poetic creation to the surface to the surface of the public sphere and which led to his gradual to Kavafi's gradual passage from invisibility to visibility with such success as to result in the holy grail of literary confirmation a place within the canon of world literature 
And it is perhaps important at this point to define what I mean by the term canon of world literature, which commonly refers not merely to works that are circulated beyond their cultural of origin, but ostensibly to the very best works worldwide that are circulated beyond their culture of origin. A good way to visualize world literature is through the image of a world library consisting of great books. Despite Goethe's unified ideal vision of a Welte Literatur, my German is not very good, sorry about that, building such a library requires us to revert to essentialist national processes of selection. This or that book for Spanish, uh, this or that book to represent Chinese literature and so, so on and so forth. And as we build, we are confronted with a few cynical truths. Firstly, we know that there is a breadth of talent that has never been recognized. Authors writing in some minor language whose works remained buried away, never to become known or read, unable to break free from the limited sphere of their creation. And this is our reminder of how relative the notion of artistic talent really is. It needs to be attributed somehow and by somebody somewhere in order to be believed. Another cynical truth resides in the relationship between non-dominant languages and translation. It is unlikely that works will find their way into our world library without having been translated into the world's dominant languages, mainly English, perhaps also French. A process that in itself offers those works their certificate of literary, sta literary standing beyond the national context. So Kavafi interests us here as a special case because in our library, in our world library of great books, a collected volume of his poems would be most likely to act as representative for modern Greek literature. And we recognize that this would not necessarily have been the case had Kavafi not been filtered through a dominant system of circulation and through a dominant language. Had Alexandria not been under British control and a crossroads for European communities in the early 20th century. And perhaps paradoxically, as I will discuss further on, had Kavafi's Greekness itself not been contested territory. Theories of the constitution of world literature by, by and large are divided into major camps, which for the sake of ease, I will divide into the optimists and the pessimists. Now the optimist camp views literature as an extensive, large scale dialogue, which serves to bring forward works from different languages and where literature is mutually enhanced through contact, enriching languages and cultures, promoting cross-national meetings and promising equal participation of cultures and of their social and cultural particularities. This literature is pluralistic rather than monological. It illuminates the unique power of translatability and can move us beyond pre-selection dictated by canonical forces. And I'm thinking here of theorists such as David Damrosch and his book, What is World Literature? Now the pessimist camp is suspicious when it comes to ideas of equal exchange and proposes that in an unequal world system where nations are subordinate to each other, this exchange will always be inflected by relationships of domination and control. The prevalent readings are going to be those of the dominance. The canon is one determined by the dominance and we are locked within power systems that work to erase political and historical struggles and that inhibit equal visibility amongst nations. And I'm thinking here of the polemics specifically of post-colonial post criticism that urges to decolonize the canon and reject the monumentalized while also seeing no way out of the hyper-central neoliberal impact of American globalization. And I'm thinking here of Spivak's death of a discipline. It is perhaps the latter camp, that of the pessimists, that the French literary theorist Pascal Casanova paved the way for in her field-defining book, World Republic of Letters, in which she described the ways in which distinct cultural fields are constituted. In this book, the main argument uh, concerns uh, authors who do not just compete as individuals, but as representatives of national traditions. 
So as representatives of um, different national contexts that we spoke about previously when it comes to the World Literature Library. And it is their success on the global field that generates value, not just for themselves as authors, but for the literary cultures to which they belong. In other words, it is only once an author has received a stamp of approval by the dominance, for example, the French or the English cultural spheres, that their value is imported on a national level, serving national aspirations to gain power as worthy competitors on the world scene. And this is one of many quotes in Casanova's work that theorized the perpetual struggle for internationalization amongst national traditions. And I quote, enthralled to the notion of literature as something pure, free, and universal, the contestants of literary space refuse to acknowledge the actual functioning of its economy, the unequal trade that takes place within it. In fact, the books produced by the least literarily endowed, endowed countries are also the most improbable. That they yet manage to emerge and make themselves known verges on the miraculous. The world of letters is in fact something quite different from the received view of literature as a peaceful domain. Its history is one of incessant struggle and competition over the very nature of literature itself. These rivalries, are what have created world literature. Cavafy was no stranger to these national come universal struggles, even as his status today serves to obscure those. Cavafy's recognition by the Anglophone world undoubtedly generated capital, not only for the poet, but for the field of modern Greek literature at large. And it would not be an exaggeration to speak of Cavafy today as Greece's national poet, Surpassing so Dionysius Solomos, who officially holds the title and whose verse has lent itself to the Greek national anthem. An easy way to quantify Kavafi's traction is Google Trends. If one compares over the last five years, Google hits in Greece related to Solomos, the national poet of Greece, and to Seferis, a Nobel Prize winner. And we take as a given here that a Nobel Prize is in theory the ultimate marker of international recognition they remain subordinate to the searches pertaining to Gavafi. So you can see the lines. The red line is in both cases, um, Solomos and then Seferis, uh, Seferis and then Solomos, and the blue line uh, represents Gavafi. And these are the Google hits in Greece. Uh, uh, so the, the, the Google hits for both Seferis and Solomos remain subordinate to the searches pertaining to Gavafi. But the discrepancy is even larger on a worldwide scale showing the extent to which Kavafi's name reigns relative to other prominent Greek figures. In other words, Kavafi is the poet who, more than any other, exemplifies the opening of modern Greek literature to the global arena, a development which is at odds with the reactions of the Greek establishment against him upon his first appearance in the early 20th century. And it, I will expand upon uh, these reactions, but this is what um, E.M. Forster's quote about uh, Kavafi's desire to be tolerated in Athens also referred to. Famously, Kavafi was approached with suspicion by his contemporaries in Greece. E.M. Forster may have exalted his achievements to the English audience as early as 1919, but in Greece, the poet was systematically mocked and parodied. Famous Greek authors, and we can take Seferis and Thotokas here as examples, waged small battles against Kavafi, or of the sort that alert us to an establishment's need to defend itself against new entries that threaten to destabilize the structure. And I think it is fair here to think of Seferis and Thotokas as those who are spearheading the Greek literary establishment in the early 20th century, the famous gener uh, generation of the 30s, Ignato Riada. Now, Kavafi's homosexuality was weaponized against him, feeding into disparaging comments about the limited value of his enclosed, stifling verse. Kavafi was not the great innovator that we think of today, but a figure undermining innovation and modernism, a relic of the past, resistant to new directions in poetry. Even as Kavafi was increasingly accepted and appreciated, Amongst, amongst Alexandrian and European circles of intellectuals, in Greece, the controversy was ongoing. 
This, of course, does not mean that Kavafi didn't have admirers and supporters in Athens, but there was a strong lobby, so to speak, that was writing negatively uh, when it comes to his work. Greek newspapers published articles that were disparaging about Kavafi's work. Speaking of trends such as Kavafolatrika, Kavafolatria, and Kavafolagnia, uh, with articles entitled uh, Mirise Kavafilas, for example, which means it stinks of Kavafi, or referring to uh, Kavafi as a um, charlatan, Enos Karagiosis, who was provocative in his use of the Greek language. And of course, and I'm not going to address this here, uh, the reason why he was called charlatan feeds into the embattled language question in Greece, but there's no time to to get into that one. The extent to which these insults were tied to sensory experience, decadent, decadent and corrupted hedonism and so forth is in fact stunning. One of the main tenets of world literature as theorized today is quote, reading from a distance, meaning engaging with the literature from afar and diversifying the canon. Yet this distance was used in Kavafi's case as a way to territorialize rather than diversify with Greece claiming itself the position of the center and deeming Kavafi and by extension the periphery to be both obsolete and corrupt. So literature emerging in Greek, in Greek from so-called cosmopolitan Alexandria surely qualifies as a, as a variant of what we think today as world literature, but here it becomes associated with a crippling detachment from the national context. Note the last phrase of the article at the very right, which I also um, have um, quoted separately at the very bottom of the screen. Kavafiism has its, had, had its supporters here in Greece. Um, sorry, Kav Kavafiism has its supporters even here in Greece. This does not surprise me since many epidemics come to us straight from Egypt. And this is also very topical, I guess. But uh, so Kavafi is likened here with an, a destructive force, an epidemic, a pathogenous factor. Beyond issues of sexuality, there is also a form of territorial anxiety inscribed in Kavafi's rejection. And I dare say this territorial anxiety is even present in the archetypal images that Seferi selected to describe Kavafi's elusive nature, the ever-changing Proteas or the cryptic Tiresias. When Seferis eventually came out to write about Kavafi as a great modernist to be paralleled only with Eliot in 1946, his critical benediction constituted a U-turn in terms of literary politics. At pains to explain how he progressed from viewing Kavafi as a man without talent, and that's an actual quote, in the early days of his appearance to appreciating him as a special case at the dawn of a new era, Seferis claimed that, at the time of the first Kavafianism, the Alexandrian was, for his critics, a ruffian or a manic old man who was playing the game of a passionate ostrich. For his admirers, who harmed his reputation even more, he was a hedonistic whisperer of ambiguous eroticism and all that. We saw him with new eyes when we also saw the world with new eyes. However, given that Kavafi had already gained uncontested stand standing in England and beyond, the logic here also seems to have been that of the bandwagon, better to jump on it than to be left behind. This story describes well the ways in which the poet was subjected to mechanisms and hierarchies of prestige. At the same time, it sometimes seems that Kavafi was not really the issue, that he rather became a cipher or proxy for the expression of broader struggles, the contact between the center and the diaspora, the internal relational conflicts in the literary sphere, and the embattled constitution of the national canonical order. This is even more so the case if we are to distrust Seferis and to propose that there were other reasons beyond changing times that conditioned Kavafi's belated domestication by the Greek literary order. These reasons were closely tethered, I believe, to Kavafi's diasporic position, which became a plane for competitions between national traditions with aspirations that transcended the national. Now, in her work, Casanova accommodates for dislocated and exiled artists that cannot fit into a single literary tradition. She also accounts for the paradoxes that burden them and their reception in relation to 
sort of dual cultural standing. For example, a writer may leave the national context, and you can think here of Nabokov, who left Russia to be integrated in the American environment. Uh, so a writer may leave their own national context, the margin, so to speak, hoping to, hoping to be given a voice at the center, only to be then eventually reintegrated with their native land. Another example uh, of a poet who uh, belongs to this category, who was also very passionate about Kavafi is Joseph Brodsky. But in Kavafi's case, we are not dealing with an author that oscillated between cultural environments or traversed geographical space. So famously, Kavafi only visited Greece three times. Rather, diasporic writing signals a work that has from the get-go stakes in two contexts, neither of which qualifies as foreign, as in the case of the exiled or immigrant writer who has left a homeland behind. Kavafi, whose poetry was a hybrid from its very inception, devoid of roots in a clearly defined national or literary field, was therefore placed within two layers of separation from a center, from a so-called center. As a resident of Egypt, he was an outsider to the Anglophone center of power. As a diasporic Greek, writing in an idiosyncratic reg register and living in Alexandria, he was an outsider to the Greek national center. Kavafi is therefore elusive in terms of the national model of world literature that Casanova designates, which accommodates for the case of exiled writers by distinguishing between, quote, national literary space and, quote, national territory, neither of which are stable denominators in Kavafi's case. Now, this multi-layered position, which operates on a terrain broader than that of the nation, is still apparent in our difficulty, difficulty to describe Kavafi. Many critics use the adjective Alexandrinos, the Alexandrian, while others call Kavafi the greatest Greek poet, or even a national poet like I did earlier. Um, it seems that to accurately, accurately depict Kavafi's status, one has to resort to lengthy descriptions. And I have often found myself editing my own manuscripts for the sake of accuracy and precision. Like many others, I have settled on something like this. The Greek Alexandrian author poet writing in modern Greek in an idiosyncratic language that merged Timotiki with Katharebusa. But this very instability of Kavafi's origins is vital in understanding, for example, the appropriative practices deployed by the Anglophone authors who engaged with his work during and after his lifetime. Cultural hybridity was not just at the heart of Kavafi's poetry in its origins, so at the time of the composition, due to what I referred to before, his diasporic uh, status, but also part of his very evolution, both in Greece and in the works of his itinerant Western admirers. And I'm thinking of here of the same authors that the Verso letter referred to, Forster, Darrell, Auden, and I will add Merrill, James Merrill. Anglophone authors, inspired by Kavafi in writing about him, located him variously in, accorders, in accordance to their own exploration. For example, for Lawrence Darrow in the Alexandria Quartet, Kavafi was the poet of Alexandria, who came to personify Darrow's own, nost own, nost own nostalgia, nostalgia for the idyllic modern Greek setting. For James Merrill, on the other hand, Kavafi was a poet who spoke to personal and poetic explorations of sexuality, fleeting encounters, and life in modern Greece in the 60s and 70s. And there are a few fascinating instances in James Merrill's memoir, which tie Kavafi specifically to the Greek setting. The first one is when he recounts taking a photo of Kimon Freyr and Sarouhis, and at the moment where he takes the, the shot, he thinks, oh my God, Kavafi lives. And that happens in Athens. Uh, in the 70s, and suddenly you have this image of a young uh, American author bringing Kavafi back into the Greek scene. And even more pertinently, he describes the story of a Belgian tourist who was duped into believing that Kavafi lived in Athens and had traveled all the way to come and meet him, even though it was many years after the poet's death. So but in both those instances, we have anecdotes that relate uh, perhaps for the first time with such persistency, uh, with, with such persistence, uh, Kavafi to the modern Greek scene. Kavafi's unfixed 
or multiple origins attracted those grappling themselves with a sense of non-belonging, uh, cultural duality or travel. Uh, it also informed emergent perspectives on his work, which often became a plane of negotiation for personal development, ambivalence and trauma. And similarly to the case of Versa books, here we see personal stories and agendas entangled with Kavafi. And the fact that many of these personal stories were linguistically central, written in English, and yet with transnational ambitions, assisted their authors to make a case for their own cosmopolitan credentials. So somebody like Forster, who went to Alexandria in 1915, uh, discovered Kavafi, and through him, he gains, um, uh, he introduces him to England. So it's almost like he has brought a foreign product, so to speak, back to the homeland and has introduced the world to a sort of curiosity in a, this oriental space of Alexandria. So this is a whole process that of course enhances, enhanced forces image as a cosmopolitan author beyond the British, British limitations and the British cultural sphere. In this sense, it is not certain that Greek writers did a disservice to Kavafi through their partial rejection and hesitation. In the economy of the Anglophone metropolitan centers, the more borderless the poet, the more appropriate he became for author's transnational artistic ambitions. And yet, at the same time, the more decisively universal and global the poet, the more likely the national context is to claim its share of the glory. And Greece certainly has claimed and continues to claim Kavafi as its own great poet. If Kavafi at his first appearance was an Alexandrian curiosity located somewhere far away, now he's closer to the Greek home than ever. And I'm thinking here of various initiatives, especially led by the Onassis Cultural Center, which also possesses the Kavafi archive that have urbanized Kavafi and located him to the here and now, highlighting his Greekness versus his Alexandrianness. Indeed, at times it appears that Kavafi is an Athenian poet. While it is indeed the case that Kavafi was exalted abroad, gaining standing through the prestige bestowed to him in England, it is the very in-between position that he occupied and the way this interacted with literary systems lodged in national contexts, whether Greek or Anglophone, that conditioned the course of his reputation in unpredictable ways. So we are looking at a poet who entered the world through a tempor temporal journey that tied his work's origins with its eventual trajectories. We can speak of Kavafi as a world poet due to his very diasporic origins, and even uh, due to the poetic themes he favored in his work. By converting episodes from history into universal predicaments, marked by falls from grace and ironic reversals of fate, Kavafi's poetry extended beyond a specific time and locality. And by reviving the expansive worlds of the Byzantine and Roman empires, it remained distance, distanced from the modern reality of nation states. And by engaging with ideas of mixture and hybridity, it challenged notions of ethnic purity. But Kavafi's literature was also made into world literature when caught up in the unequal world system of literary distribution between Western centers and regional peripheries, it was eventually counted amongst the select few masterpieces that make up the international literary order. And this was to a large extent, a result of the interaction between Kavafi's position and the shifting international and polyglot affiliations of those who wrote about him. Now, a distance from origins, David, the theorist David Porter suggests, means to accept that others beyond the author participate in making works and determining their meanings. In other words, Kavafi's multiple origins were crafted anew as they were blended into the culturally and spatially disparate viewpoints of influential readers who sought to make sense of the conduct between the West and its others sometimes even in patronizing ways, as they sought to define exile by glorifying cosmopolitan Alexandria or by exoticizing modern Greece as the land of 
adventure and transgression. At the same time, it was in this way that Cavafy celebrators led his poetry uh, through an expanding geography that spanned three continents and a number of major cities, including metropolitan centers of literary consecration, namely London and New York. Now, these affiliations became inscribed upon Cavafy's growing acclaim and inform his place today in world literature. They also inform the increase of the modern Greek literary production's worth on the global scene. And it, I think it, it is not oversimplifying uh, the fact if we speak of a modern Greek literature as perceived abroad as having been strengthened through the presence of Kavafi. David Porter writes about origins and trajectories. And he says that the future study of world literature will take this migra migratory tendency of literature as a starting point rather than anomaly. And it will follow the epidemiologist in posing fewer questions about origins and more about trajectories. This view of the discipline reconfigures the fears of Kavafi's early critics who compared him to a dangerous epidemic originating in Egypt. He turns attention instead to his global spread and to the many mutations that have determined the text that we read today. By being both transnational and contested, Kavafi's work lent itself to travels and crossings and to redefinitions of exile and dislocation. If he has become a figure of utmost national interest in Greece for the international prestige he confers following the Casanova model, he is also a case that speaks to the a national visions of the optimists of world literature, where world literature is a space of exchange, of borderless contact, and of a departure from, or even defiance of, national origins. Thank you very much. <laughs>